Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paolo Gentili. I am the Associate Director of Head Cinema Studies. It's a great occasion, a great collaboration that we have with the Perevia uh, Jewish Film Festival. We have been collaborating for many years with them, with our uh, other segment of the Middle East Film Festival. And when uh, our dear friend uh, Ies and Olivia proposed to us this uh, master class, we very much were happy to uh, collaborate. I just wanted to uh, welcome to you all of them and uh, hope that you have the chance to come more often for our event. Uh, very easily uh, check on our pen cinema and media studies uh, event together with the Refugee um, uh, website and uh, uh, I want to express my thanks to uh, the Master Solo for present here. Uh, the, uh, um, today's uh, uh, Master class is going to be composed of two different parts. We're going to have a first part with uh, Mr. Solo and uh, Igor uh, talking about uh, his art and then followed by a very small break. And then Professor Peter De Cherny from uh, our department, from Penn Cinema Studies, we also uh, moderate the conversation the second part from two to three with uh, Mr. Solz. Uh, at the end, there will be a very nice reception downstairs. So if you're patient and welcome you to enjoy great cinema and actually great food to fall. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce you Olivia Artis, very uh, familiar with uh, her and who will have Thank you very much. Thank you so much for The whole entire um, reason we wanted to collaborate with Penn Cinema Studies was to introduce each other to each other. So I hope all of you will check out the Philadelphia Jewish Film Festival um, in the future. We do have one more event left, closing night tomorrow night at the Gershwin Y. Um, it's called Women in Shorts. And it is four Israeli short films by or about women. And we have the director here, Iris Saki, who directed the, um, the feature short, the first short in the series called Women in Sync. It's an amazing documentary. We hope you can check it out tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. in Gershwin Live. And um, thanks again for coming. It's a thrill to have Todd Solans here. He's an amazing, prolific director, very unique. I'm sure you're going to find the conversation with Igor and with Peter um, very illuminating. And I don't want to take up any more um, time. I just want to give you some background information about our moderators. Igor Sterenberg is the director of the Miami Jewish Film Festival and the founder and director of the Popcorn Frights Film Festival. And he's with us today from Miami. Welcome, Igor. And um, after our conversation, <laughs> we're going to have Peter Descherny, who many of you already know, so we'll save um, the bio for later. Um, thanks again. Enjoy the master class. And please check us out at pjf.org. It's a thrill for, uh, for me to have the opportunity to share this hour session with you, Todd. I, I've been a fan of your work since my days as an undergrad, uh, and that says a lot about me. Uh, I really just enjoy the, the, the world that you're able to create in your work. Um, and I'm just curious, in terms of the audience, how many of you are familiar with Todd's work? How many of you have seen at least more than two of his films? Great. All right, so maybe we'll ask you trailers since there's a very familiarity. Um, I'm just, as a start question, um, family, kids, they play such a critical role. There's, they're, they're, they're subjects that are so prevalent in so many of your films. Um, what was your childhood like growing up in New Jersey? Uh, did you come to the Yeah, is there some sort of trauma you experienced? That, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to Children, 
I absorb it like a sponge, and they, after the years, they had to pull me out because I, I got too religious for them. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I went to a public school, and I went to a progressive school, and I went to a prep school, and, um, uh, and uh, they all, of course, informed me in, in terms of my sense of the world, and um, uh, family, uh, of course, it's, look, it's, it's still a perennial, you know, it's a, it's a subject, you, there, it, even the idea of escaping it is, is to talk about escaping it, the it, which is the subject, so you can never escape what defines you. So you have to, in some sense, uh, use that as a source of investigative work, let's say, to help them understand the sense of yourself vis-a-vis -vis the world as you understand it. But uh, I'm getting off into too many abstractions. I don't want to, to bore everybody with the details sure. of my time. So, okay, so let's jump into four of your special words. Fear, anxiety, and depression. Uh, which is your first film, and I think the title has absolutely uh, played a theme through so many of the films that follow it. Fear, anxiety, and depression. I, I can say at least this much for certain. The last two weeks have certainly left a mark on me as fear, anxiety, and depression. Um, but what was the experience like making a movie that? Uh, and it was a learning for you, it was a debut film. Uh, a lot of things didn't work out the way you envisioned. Um, and then there was a period of six years since you made your second film. Um, what did you Igor, you can you talk more towards yeah. here? It's hard to hear. We are trying to get this microphone working. It's all right. If it doesn't go recorded, it will live. We can't hear it, but we can hear you. You can hear it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, now we can hear you, but the board arms. I hope so. Yes. Yes, I made a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't 
going to get any sympathy from any of my former classmates who were still in school, uh, but it was really, it was perhaps the most, uh, I, I wasn't at the bottom emotionally, I was very depressed at that time. Um, and um, uh, it was so it was a deeply unhappy time for me, and uh, ultimately this movie uh, was born from that uh, period, uh, and I, I didn't want it to be finished, never mind released. Um, but it, so it's always been um, in the back of my head as a kind of experience to never forget. I thought that would be the end, and I decided after that, I thought I had to figure out what I would do with my life, and so I um, I became, for a while I was in English, one of the things I did was I was an English teacher for primarily Russian immigrants. Um, and I was, for the first time, I was so happy because I was devoid of all ambition. Um, and um, there were a lot of aspiring artists and so forth that taught at this center. And I remember they all they would ask, you know, so what do you do? Like, what do you really do when you're not teaching? And I, I said, I just told people I was a computer programmer. It was too painful. It was so true. I knew if I said I was a computer programmer, you know, I knew the eyes glaze over very fast, and so that was my that was my way of coping with that that humiliation. What inspired you? What inspired you to get back to write? To write? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I at a certain point, I had been there for a while, and I was very happy, as I said teaching, and I said, oh, this is wonderful, I, I, I have no ambition, and, uh, and I just felt very liberated, very free, but at, at the same time I was a little bit scared, and uh, I said, do I want to do this when I'm 40 or 50, will I survive, and then I, I really got scared. And I had written a script, I had actually written a script for Welcome to the Dollhouse before I even finished that first film really to redeem myself from, from that uh, painful experience, and, um, uh, and I did nothing with it, um, but um, at a certain point I think I felt I didn't want that, last, that, that first movie to have the last word, and so I found it somehow within me to uh, start talking to people and approaching people that I have known to get the movie financed and made. And I thought, well, maybe if I make this movie, I can have some sort of local director for higher career and do after-school specials. That was my hope. And... Um, my dream was maybe I could play the film form, but that was beyond my, beyond even contemplating because it was just too lofty an ambition. Um, uh, I made the film and um, I remember uh, showing cuts to people who didn't sit through the whole thing and, and felt bad for me. And um, and so it wasn't paranoia that made me feel that I had failed yet again and I didn't think I could survive it, but I really didn't. Um, but then other people, I, I remember getting a fax from Toronto and the, and the fax said that the film was accepted to the festival there and I really thought it was a crack. I couldn't believe it. Um, and then my life changed. It just changed, and suddenly um, I was able to just write scripts and make movies, and that wasn't something I had backed on. And um, I'm always grateful for that, for that good luck that came my way, because luck has so much to do with it. Um, 
I feel on a dime, really, my life could have turned out so differently. And there is a, a, a tremendous gratification for all the nightmares that are in the arduous work that goes into filmmaking. Um, I'm always uh, grateful to have survived it and uh, not to be uh, embarrassed by it. Those are always my two priorities, and I haven't been since I, I made that film. And, um, and, and I hope, because I lose money for so many people, I, I hope that I get to continue to making, uh, continue making movies. Um, I always assume each movie is my last. Um, and then I get lucky. So I'm hoping to shoot another one next year. But, you know, everything is so uncertain. And if one wants to pursue a career in filmmaking, it is a life, like any life in the arts, it is one of instability and uncertainty. One for which one must make sacrifices if one is to be taken seriously. Uh, especially by yourself. Um, that's their, that, That's my life story. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was inspiring to some of you because, as Tom had said, uh, the business is very uncertain, unstable, and um, perseverance is very key. Uh, don't be defeated uh, by the first rejection. Well, if you have to be told that, then you're really not cut out for it. Um, I, I teach at um, a graduate film program at NYU. I'm a full-time teacher. Um, I, uh, I love teaching. I have so much fun doing it. I'm so grateful not to be young and hopeful and ambitious. <laughs> I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is. Um, and uh, there's uh, tremendous uh, stress and, and competition and, and, and it's hard sometimes to, to even see what you are doing, to understand what you are doing. But, but it's school, so it's just like any other school, it's a place to grow up, to begin to grow up and have an understanding of yourself as an artist if that is your ambition. Um, I think that there are many students who may be very talented from time to time. There are some very talented people, but talent is always just one of many components into making a career in film. It is one thing to make a movie, it is another thing to make, uh, to have a career. I think if I were French, uh, it would be uh, a, a lot easier for me than I, it is as I am an American because um, in French they have subsidies for filmmakers uh, to uh, make films that could be um, <coughs> uh, challenging uh, the status quo and uh, the studio system. That doesn't exist here. Here it's all driven by the marketplace, so it's very rare to uh, find filmmakers that actually can have a career uh, of durability. Uh, uh, and when I look at my students, that's something no one can know and no one can uh, forecast just who and how many will actually be able to continue working as filmmakers. Um, because that tenacity that he refers to, that perseverance, um, that's something I certainly can't teach. Um, but if you're not, if your film isn't so important to you, then it really doesn't matter. Well, you kind of rose to fame, uh, and your films certainly started to pick up, uh, and you had the opportunity to continue making movies at a time in American cinema and independence. Um, we had the. Uh, rise of Sundance and the Weinstein Company who are releasing films and other distributors. Do you think there's a, a certainly a change in climate from then to now? Do there more opportunity for these different distribution models and channels? Well, there's a plus and a minus, a yin and a yang to all of this. I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful time to be, uh, if you're a young aspiring filmmaker, because 
of the advances in technology that make filmmaking so much more accessible um, uh, because of the digital uh, advances. Um, uh, many young people can make movies without having to go to Hollywood and so forth, without having to go to film school, that's for sure. Um, so the, the technically that has advanced in ways that are very meaningful for, for young people. Um, not that people who are not so young can't be filmmakers also. <laughs> I shouldn't be prejudiced. <laughs> but, um, on the other hand, the bar has been raised. It's not enough just to say, well, I made a feature, and I made it for only $6,000. Nobody really cares. Um, uh, it's very hard to get a theatrical release, to get the attention uh, that you would like your movie to get. Um, it happens, but it's one out of thousands, you know, very, very rare instances where it happens. So, um, anyone who's an investor in films, in, in independent cinema, uh, knows the odds, and the best kind of investor really is one who is delighted to invest in a project that they think is worthy, um, but never with the sense that they'll ever see their money back. Um, I think that uh, uh, there are what they call platforms and venues that go beyond the traditional cinema and television, of course, today, which opens up a lot of doors for young people getting, developing and uh, finding audiences. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's always a challenge, it's always been a challenge. The challenges are just shifting and a little bit different. Anytime you want to make a movie, that aim is something more than simply to entertain. Um, anything that is challenging uh, to audiences artistically or politically uh, is always going to be more difficult to get financed. Um, and, uh, but nobody, no filmmaker goes into the career uh, or the pursuit of filmmaking uh, because uh, uh, they think it will be uh, easy or even remunerative. Um, but um, uh, you do it because you have to do it. And some illogical sense, some irrational part of you feels that drive, that need, to put that expressive, uh, uh, in, in some expressive, give expressive form to what you have to say. Um, and that's what, what keeps me always um, uh, hopeful and optimistic, is that every year as people bemoan the state of cinema and how, how terrible Hollywood is and how many bad movies there are and there's nothing to see and there are a thousand channels and nothing is on, um, at the same time, uh, I am surprised every year by young filmmakers, filmmakers from abroad, people I hadn't known about who, who produce work that is compelling. Um, so I think that compelling work will always find its audience. Um, uh, and so, and so, so to that extent, I, I, I do remain optimistic. Moving on from falling to the house to happiness, which you made three years after. Um, how many of you have seen happiness? Um, it's, it's certainly an extraordinary drama. Uh, it stars late Philip Seymour Hoffman amongst another uh, ensemble cast. And uh, what Todd had confronted, and one of the particular strings in the narrative, was the story of uh, a pedophile. Uh, a certain taboo subject that uh, rarely is addressed on screen. What I found personally so remarkable about the film is the way that you're um, making us aware of, of a certain kind of, of cruelty that we're all capable of. Because the individual is presented as uh, a good husband, uh, a good father, a good neighbor. And yet there's this demon inside that slowly the story unfolds, becomes more present. 
um, and it takes over. At least that's the way I read it. Um, I wonder what you'd like to comment about that. Um, what is it like attacking uh, such difficult subject matter and uh, presenting it on the screen? So far? I don't know. I, 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 I look at it, any particular subject as inherently difficult. Um, it's what the challenge is always how to animate and to, to vitalize uh, the material that you want to explore. Um, uh, certainly the subject of, of uh, pedophilia is nothing new. I didn't invent it. I mean, it's in the papers every day. It was 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so there was nothing, um, uh, in some sense, it's, it's somewhat surprising that it wasn't addressed more frequently since it was in the news every day of the week about another child kidnapped and molested or something horrible like that. Um, but um, I think that's really ever since probably Aton Pate's story, that was some of you may remember. Uh, back in 79, I think that was. After which we began to associate milk cartons with pictures of little children. Um, and a kind of hysteria began to set in, which lives with us still today. In fact, I would say in a heightened form today. Uh, hysteria uh, to the extent that the idea of uh, a young man wanting to volunteer with the Boy Scouts already become suspect. Um, so it's very problematic, uh, but that makes it that much more compelling a subject for me to want to explore. My film, at the same time, as it is a tragedy, is also a satire and a comedy, and that makes it that much trickier for audiences. But that's all of my work. It's all fraught with ambiguity, and which is why I have such a divided response to everything that I do, where half the audience might laugh, and the other half, half if they're not walking out, might might be angry at the first half. How can you laugh? This is so sorrowful and so sad. But for me, it is both concurrently. Um, this is uh, the story, uh, uh, one of the, the stories referring to is, is of a man uh, who uh, does um, uh, perpetrate these crimes against children. But what makes it tragic is that he loves his own children, his, his son, and that he, he loves his family. And so that's where the dimension of tragedy uh, comes into play. Um, it, it was, um, uh, I, I knew that uh, it, it was touching, that it was a very tender uh, uh, chord that the movie was touching. Um, from the first responses to the film, um, it showed, I think, yeah, it premiered at Cannes, and I remember at the time the distributor, the, the, the person who financed it, the company was called October Films. October Films uh, was run by a man named Bingham Ray, who had wanted to who was very angry that he lost out on acquiring Welcome to the Dollhouse, and so he really wanted to work with me and make this movie, and he made it happen. Now, October Films was the subsidiary of Universal Pictures, in the same way that Fox Searchlight has that relationship with 20th Century Fox, and other studios have their sort of little independent divisions. And um, when, after Cannes, there was an article in Variety about the films that October had uh, financed, and the head of Universal, Ron Meyer, um, he um, uh, saw the film and he deemed it morally repugnant. 
And so he told October Films that they were not allowed to distribute the film. And what he did instead was he enabled an independent company to be created that he would give a loan to so that the movie could be distributed. So that in the end, if this morally repugnant movie could turn a profit, he'd be the first one. <laughs> because as everyone knows, the only thing that's morally repugnant in Hollywood is losing money. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the movie, I never was worried because, it, I mean, the funny thing is that even, like, even in France, where it, where it, where it uh, had its premiere in Cannes, not a single French distributor would buy the movie. None of them would pay for it. Everyone was very much afraid. And we found a young woman who was just starting up, and she distributed the movie in France, and with an advance of zero. Um, and the movie was very profitable, particularly in Europe. Um, I, I never uh, worried because it had too much press, there was too much talk about it, and it was, it, look, my movies are played in all 50 states. I've seen, like, charts even there in, like, Alabama, Mississippi, it's been in every state, so I don't have anything to complain about. Uh, I, I mean, we, it, 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 we don't get much into Africa and the Middle East, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, but, um, I, but, uh, I, so I, 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 I don't feel, um, I never felt victimized or, uh, uh, oh, okay. um, um, no, it's alright, I didn't want to kill this. It's a to see. So I, 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 always was, I was always very pleased that it had such a uh, response and, and um, nothing to complain about there. But you know, when any time you make a movie, uh, when you write a movie, I never design a movie with the sense of it being profitable, that it's going to be a big hit. I, I don't think that way. I think, what is the story that compels me? What is the story that I want to tell? And if I'm lucky, maybe it will turn a profit. Maybe it, it, it will find some financial success, but I don't go into it that way. And so that's part of the sacrifice of, uh, that I, one of the sacrifices that I've made, which is that by not choosing to uh, make movies uh, that would be uh, certainly much more likely to be profitable, um, it becomes much more difficult for me to survive as a filmmaker. Um, but someone like, I know Scorsese and Soderbergh, you know, they have talked in the past about how they do one for them, one for, one for, the, one for the studio, one for themselves. And for me, um, I, I couldn't do that. Uh, it's, it's just too much, too much work. It's too hard for me to, to make a movie. To, I don't want to die on the set of a movie I didn't really want to make. That wasn't for me. <laughs> um, I, 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 I always, I never presume, I never, never know how long we have to live. And I want to live what I live with the, uh, devoted to those things that have meaning to me. Um, which perfectly leads back to the next one that you made, Storytelling. It's this brilliant bifurcated narrative split into two sections, narrative, uh, fiction and nonfiction. Um, and I, I'm just curious if you could speak to you about the subject of one of the particular scenes in the film that is uh, very sexy. Um, and it has this uh, sort of orange centered box uh, that you had uh, put over it so that you would be able to get this screen that you needed 
because you were very driven to have the, the, your, your initial intention that you had written on screen presented fully as. Yes, I made a movie called Storytelling After Happiness. Um, I did, did anyone see that movie? Oh, some of you did. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, I knew that this script had some material that was going to be a little troubling for a studio. And so in the contract, at the get-go, I said, in order to procure an R rating, which is what they require, um, I would be able to use beeps and or bars as necessary. Um, because I didn't want to be in a situation where I have to simply remove something. I didn't want to cut anything out, because if you cut something out, then the audience never knows what you intended. Whereas if it's there, you have a shot, and in the middle of the shot there's a big red box, well, the audience knows what I had in mind here. And I did take pleasure, I, I, I did, in making, I think, the first and maybe only studio film ever made that has a big red box in the middle of it. <laughs> they were not happy with it. <laughs> the head of the studio was not happy at all putting a red box in the middle of the movie. <laughs> I was happy though. <laughs> um, and, and in some sense, I felt bad for all the Europeans who never got to see the big red box. <laughs> no, no, yeah, there, there are two versions. There's the, uh, there's, essentially, there's the full version, and then there's the full version with the box. The box, the one with the box is basically the family version. <laughs> and then the one without the box is the is European. the European. <laughs> and in fact, if you purchase, if it's on eBay, I don't know, some DVD of it, you can click and choose the one that's the family version or the European version. They use other terms, but um, and it, well, the only difference being that one has a red box in the middle of it. Um, I remember it happens that, that the movie, um, uh, at the end of the summer of 01, it was just after 9-11 it happened, and I was at the New York Film Festival, and I remember a lot of movies at the time had to remove shots of the World Trade Center because it was too disturbing, too troubling, and so a, a lot of studio movies were going back in and cutting out any shot that had the World Trade Center. Well, my movie had a shot of the World Trade Center in it, but they didn't want to put a big red box in it. <laughs> but, <laughs> the only reason is, is that it costs money. They lost enough money, so it was spent enough. Um, but, um, thank you. Thank you, I should have asked him. Um, so, um, it, it, uh, I, I'm, it, it's, it definitely is a movie, though, that I think speaks very much to a lot of the issues of campus life today. But I don't really want to talk about a movie that only about 3% of you have seen. Um, so, we should move on. You should, but you should see it. Very, very, very sweet, delightful, charming. I wouldn't call that scene as talking about sexy. <laughs> I would never use that word. I wouldn't. I, it is a sex scene, but it was well, sexy is not the word I would use to describe this. Okay. He, he's brutal. It's just a very scary... I remember they were going at it. It was so intense. I had to look away. I couldn't watch. And then I would ask them to do it again. <laughs> but it was very intense, very scary, very troubling. 
And fortunately, at a location, the neighbors were deaf. <laughs> um, your next film, uh, 2004, was Palindrome. Um, I, what I found so incredible about it, because I didn't think I've ever seen a film like it before, in the way that you used eight different actors to play one character. Her name is Deviva. Um, what inspired you to take such an incredible, and very risky, challenging narrative uh, device in using eight different. Well, I think I, I think I, as a filmmaker, I like to play. I like to. Not everyone wants to play with me, but I like to play. <laughs> and I like to play with form, and I like to play with ideas, and it seems challenging and exciting and 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 integral to the story I was telling. And so. Um, uh, the story, briefly, is of, of, of a young girl who's somewhere suspended bet who, between parents who are pro-choice, but give her no choice and force her to have an abortion, and a pro-life family that kills abortionists. And this young girl is suspended, really, between these two worlds. And um, I, it, it was, I knew that the material was not going to get me into the multiplex, but I never had that as my ambition. Um, and, uh, I, I'm very fortunate that I was able to get it together to make such a peculiar sort of film that um, was still in a time when people, it was just before I think YouTube had got taken off, so people were still going to the movies. Today, I teach at film school, my students don't even go to the movies. <laughs> and so we laugh, but it's, that's the sad state of affairs, because if, the, if people aren't going to these independently made films, uh, there is an, uh, if the marketplace can support the continuation of the making of these films. Um, that's what is the, really the big challenge and big troubling situation. Um, uh, somehow, a lot of first movies are able get to be made, but it's hard to get a career off in this climate. Did you, did you Self-finance? Did you invest some of your own funds? I, I put some money, but I certainly didn't have enough money to pay for the whole thing. I put some money. Even though it says, and I know I read it says I put my life savings. <laughs> I would never be so foolish. <laughs> <laughs> Did it change the way you approach the scene in any way that you would have that much more at stake? Or is it? You know, when you're a director, you're not rational, and you don't think about, I don't think about money. I, I don't think about anything except what I have to get. And I have to surround myself with people who are responsible and remind me and let me know why I can't have what I want. And now I have to think around and figure out how to make more economical choices and so forth. Um, uh, but I, I, I certainly the script was modestly conceived. I, I wrote it with a sense that it could be done on a modest uh, budget. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. The next film was in 2009, uh, Life During Wartime. Yeah. Um, it's uh, not a literal sequel, maybe a thematic sequel in some way uh, to Happiness. Uh, many of the characters you revisit, but not the same actors play these characters. You recast them which is a really bold and interesting uh, decision. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious, uh, do you have an interest or in any way to, what intrigues you about bringing back so many of your characters in, in your films? It's, it's sort of, I think you mentioned in one of the interviews, you don't like to uh, address that about acting yeah. actually, but it's certainly a Solantian universe in a way. Um, just, I, I don't know, I, I, 
Yes, I mean, my, my family would not describe it as so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, um, you know, when Truffaut made his Antoine Cornell films, he had the same actor play this character at several stages of his life. And, and when you do that, um, there's something beautiful and heartbreaking about that because it becomes about mortality inherently. We all sense and see the, the way in which we age irrevocably. Um, when you choose to recast uh, a character with a different actor, um, uh, you open up different possibilities of looking at that character with different kinds of meaning and different kinds of nuance. Um, and that's what I think excited me when I chose to pursue a sequel of the, that, of that movie, Happiness. Um, and um, it's always, you always want to make it fresh for yourself. You always want to, you know, Isaiah Berlin wrote this essay very famous a hundred years ago or so about the, the fox, what's the hedgehog? And the fox, yeah. And two discreet kinds of personalities. Um, uh, one, uh, artistic personalities, one which uh, goes about uh, exploring all different types of subject matter, like an Ang Lee, for example, who goes from genre to genre. And then there are other filmmakers who have their Whole, so to speak, which through in, in which they descend and deeper and deeper mining for material that stones unturned, so to speak. I'm simplifying, but that probably is descriptive of the way in which my career has turned out. I didn't know that that's that I was a hedgehog. I only learned that at the time. I said, I guess that's what I am. Um, I'm curious about um, how you approach uh, coverage and composition in your films. Uh, I think this is the film you worked with Ed Lachman on. I did work with Ed on this one, yes. And then you also worked with him, uh, it was the first time you actually returned to work with a cinematographer again, the Wiener Dog. Yeah. Um, what was the experience like working with him? Working with Ed? Um, look, I love Ed, and we had a, a very quick um, kind of chemistry connection, what have you, with each other. Um, with whomever, I've had really great collaborations with a number of cameramen, by the way, but, but Ed, um, he, is, he is very much an artist um, and respectful of uh, the supremacy of story. Um, and so everything that we do, and, and, and as we go scouting for locations and talking about coverage, um, is all in service of the story. Um, because if it's not, uh, it, it's, uh, it becomes either an indulgence or it becomes uh, something self-conscious, something that's a distraction. Uh, from what is essential. Um, and uh, what, with Ed, like with any DP I could work with, I mean, I, I often re reference at the very beginning of my conversations when we're in preparation, in the prep period, uh, I go, we go through every page of the script and uh, I have a lot of, I, I, I like still photography, a lot of photographers I refer to, and I take out books and pictures I show him, and he, he knows what, he understands my sensibility, and he has a sense of humor, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> uh, he gets um, where I'm coming from. 
and we can have a shorthand and I say we'll go scouting and we'll say ah, I see there's an Eggleston right here and he'll know what I'm talking about okay uh, or we'll talk about Larry Sultan another photographer whose work we both responded to um, and the way in which we can translate that effect in what we, the story we are trying to tell. Um, I tend to, when I write, um, I already am thinking about the camera and the coverage, uh, really the mise-en-scene, the way in which I would like it to play itself out. All of this has to be very fluid because as you get uh, your very restrictive budget and uh, and the constraints of locations, you have to modify and rethink. Um, because that's what a filmmaker has to be both very rigorous and at the same time very fluid and open. Um, it's, it's navigating that line. So, um, Ed is, uh, he's fastidious. He is very fastidious. And I, I uh, am grateful for that, being um, not quite as fastidious. <laughs> I don't know if you'll agree. Um, but, um, uh, so it's hard, you know, when people ask, you know, what was your approach? It's really about, it's just a conversation that sometimes is partly verbal and partly pictorial from the, the, the pictures I show or the locations we see and the way we figure out how we can make it happen. So there are uh, still photographers that you we routinely... Uh, no, no, they change, they change from project to project. I, I, it, it, otherwise it would be very uninteresting if I was like constantly uh, 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 bringing out um, uh, some... I don't know, some Diane Arbus or something every time, you know, that would be very tiresome. Um, okay. Before we open up uh, to the audience, uh, let's revisit one more film, uh, Dark Horse. Yeah. That was in uh, 2011. Yeah. Um, uh, correct me, again, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, the film to me played almost uh, uh, like a perfect response to those man-child films that were being released at their peak around that time, Play like Virgin, uh, Dark, and so on. Um, was that a phenomenon that was interesting to you when you were writing it or shaping the narrative? Yeah, well, it's funny, with that movie, I remember I wanted to just tell a simple boy meets girl story, and that's what happened. <laughs> um, I... Um, uh, yes, I am responsive to the infantilization um, of young men and not so young men. Um, the way in which um, the world conspires to um, exacerbate this infantilization. Um, but um, it was also, uh, for me, it was a very emotional, emotionally fraught um, story. Telling a story of a, a boy, in some sense, a, a boy, a young man, not so young, who lives with his parents still in his 30s. Um, and this boy, this young man, is someone I think that many people would actually prefer both Osama bin Laden and the pedophile to happen to have dinner with this guy. <laughs> He's just someone you don't want to introduce him, your friends, to because he doesn't have the sparkling personality, let's say, that winning charm that we all aspire towards. Um, and Precisely because he could be dis dismissed as just a jerk. Um, that's what interested me, the way, how could I dig at bringing some, some empathy, 
some way, some, some feeling for this poor man-child who we would all rather dismiss out of hand. And then there was Wiener, though. Most recently, that was a really... Um, is there something about Don Wiener that compels you to revisit her? This is the second uh, film following up to Dollhouse. Well, she did die. I killed yeah. her in palindromes. Um, but I, I, when I killed her in palindromes, I always thought maybe one day there will be an opportunity to offer her another life trajectory, something, something more, something not so grim. And, and I do in this, this was an opportunity, in fact, to offer her a kind of, I would say, the most romantic ending I've done in any movie. Um, uh, sort of the, the, the one that's most hopeful. Um, uh, and um, she had been, of course, uh, uh, made fun of at school, in junior high school, and called a wiener dog, and so it seemed fitting to bring her back. Let's open it up to the audience if you have questions. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned you were a full-time teacher. And uh, anyway, how do you balance that with your filmmaking? Well, the great thing about teaching there is they're very flexible. I, um, I shot Wiener Dog in the summer of 15, so I wasn't teaching that. And I edited it while I was teaching in the fall without any difficulty, really. So. If I needed to take time off, I'm actually taking a sabbatical next spring, this next semester. So, but even if I weren't, they would let me take time off to make a movie, um, which I think is smart for them for a number of reasons. One of which also is like I always think from my head. I, I'm, I'm not so optimistic. I think what are the chances anyone's going to give me money to make another movie? So, um, but I've been wrong every time, you know, so I hope I'm, I hope I'm still wrong and I get to make one very soon. I had a friend of finance. They did, yes, they did the last one, yes. What's it like uh, having Megan Ellis on your side? Was uh, it a good relationship? I love um, Megan. I mean, she's preternaturally mature. I mean, a young woman, she was not even 30. Um, and she had a number of very high profile successes as a as a film producer and she was lovely to work with. Yeah. Yeah. We we, we would like to do something again. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, sorry, I would like to go back to storytelling. In your films uh, it looks like to me there is um, in in the diegetic words uh, the diegetic words of your film seems to have a very precise actual referent which is uh, the American suburbia of the 80s, 90s, and so on. At the same time, there, is, uh, there are several instances, anti-realistic instances in your film, for, the, for example, the use of extra-rejected sound many times, or the radiant brilliance of uh, the images in uh, life in wartime. Um, and so I was interested in, like, can, can you talk about uh, uh, a little about the relationship between the two segments of uh, uh, storytelling and actually how does your film configure this relationship between reality and fiction? Because I think that's sort of like a meta-cinematic work uh, on... Oops. Yes, you... So intellectual, your question, and I don't want to answer it in intellectually. Um, I, I don't want to, and I don't want to explain either. Um, I can one day, you know, one of the things I do, as a, as I have done for uh, the last couple of years, while well, as as a teacher, is at the end of the year I have one class um, of students about to complete their coursework. And in one of my last classes, I actually show them um, an epilogue that um, I had shot for that movie. I had shot more than one. In fact, 
Um, I don't take pride in this, but I had shot, I had shot an epilogue that I really loved. Loved it, and I just felt, I felt I didn't earn it. I just felt I hadn't earned it. And so I went back to the studio and said, will you let me shoot another epilogue? And they hated the one that, they hated my epilogue, but I loved it, okay. So I had another idea and I wrote another epilogue and they let me shoot it. Now this is what filmmaking is like. So they gave me $100,000 to shoot this two minute epilogue. And I loved it also. <laughs> but it wasn't quite the way I wanted the movie to end. And so basically the $100,000 went out the window and there's no epilogue. <laughs> <laughs> and, I like, and I have two epilogues, I love them both. Um, that's why I hope if anyone wants to work with me again. <laughs> uh, less deep question. In Dark Horse, there's a very memorable shot to me of a Toys R Us, and the sign is completely blurred out. And in Wiener Dog, I noticed very early on in the film, there's a scene in the car, and in the background you can see a Toys R Us sign, and I was wondering if there was any leftover frustration, no, 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 or no, no, if it was no. like an accident. It's, it's funny that it's, you are observant. Um, <laughs> In, uh, when I did Dark Horse, I wanted to shoot a scene inside Toys R Us, and they would not let us. And they would not let us, because we had the tripod in the parking lot, i.e. on the property, we were not allowed to use the sign. But I didn't want to put a phony kind of name. I, didn't, I could easily have come up with, like, Toys uh, for everyone, or something that it would have just, it's like when you see movies where they say, Give me your phone number, okay, 555. Five, five. It's like, Yeah, I mean, it just pulls you out because it's so phony. And I want to do a phony name. So I felt audiences are familiar enough from reality TV, things being blurred, that they would get, I didn't get permission, Toys R Us, the Empire of toy <laughs> retailers, because there's no one else. Okay, they are an empire. Um, so, that actually we had to go to the Dominican Republic to get my interior of Toys R Us. Um, isn't it fun making movies? <laughs> um, but, I... It was just chance. We were doing um, second unit photography on Wiener Dog, and we were, I, I wanted a uh, a, a certain um, uh, route, highway in, in Paramus, New Jersey area, filled with lots of shopping centers, to be the backdrop. And it just happened that we got a Toys R Us as we were going by, and I said, "Love it." <laughs> Uh, what was the process like shaping uh, the main character in Dark Horse, like with the actor? Like, what? How did you get him mm -hmm. to be that character? Well, if he were here, he would tell you he already was set seventy-five, eighty percent that character. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, and um, as I, you know, it, it was, it was. Um, I just felt, I knew I had a very strong sense of what I wanted this um, character to be. Um, and I knew he would be very off-putting for a lot of people, but that was, as I said, that was my challenge. That I knew someone that would be very off-putting for so many, but somehow for me, I just, all I could see was the heart bleeding in every scene. I just... That's all I felt was his heart on his sleeve, and I was driven by that that uh, effusion of sorrow and pain that that everybody else was not looking at. That's where I was, and and uh, so that's where it came from. In storytelling. Uh, 
you see seen those Sun of Blair, reads a short story to a creative writing class about the scary sex scene in the red box. She reads the story and then her peers rip the story to shreds. They even say uh, it's unrealistic or not unbelievable. It's unbelievable and somebody yells it's cliche. And Sun of Blair yells out, you know, but it happened, it happened to me. Uh, you tell your film students that they should make a movie that only they can make, but I don't know that they want to watch. Can you just talk a little bit about writing something very personal that isn't savvy or boring or cliche? You're good. You're prepared. You got that quote. My quote that I say to my students often is, you want to make a movie that only you can make, but not only you can sit through. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think it's... Everybody comes at storytelling from a different place, okay? And I don't want, I certainly with my students, I don't want them to be like me or to do anything the way I would do it, okay? My goal is to try to help the students find themselves through this process of storytelling so that they can shine as who they are. There is no rule for uh, read one this one book and it's 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 uh, when it comes to writing and telling stories it's it's a lifelong pursuit okay and it's something that uh, I think takes for some people they can be prodigies and they can find that voice in some sense that way of expressing themselves early on in life. And for many people, some writers don't really come into, into bloom until their 50s or even later. Just think of Penelope Fitzgerald. Um, so, um, uh, there are, you, you have to accept that in some sense, there are no rules about how you go about this, but there, I suppose, in some sense, there is the rule that you have to figure out how is it that you can engage your audience without, at the same time, compromising the integrity of the material you're trying to dramatize. So I can't. I don't have lecture. I don't lecture. I don't. They call me a teacher. Okay. <laughs> what do I do? I come. I read. And I give them my thoughts, but I want to hear what their thoughts are. I want to hear what everyone else. And it, because the funny thing is, once I always ask my students when they give me, and I'll say, "Give me a story, five pages maximum." I I will ask them. I will ask. I'll have ten people around me, and I ask them, "Okay, someone, tell me, what is the story here?" And then three, four people answer, and I hear three or four different stories. And that's the thing that's elusive. We all, we write something, and we think we know what we've written. But filmmaking, if it is anything, it is a process of discovery. And I've always said, you know, I write my script, and I think, and it's a kind of arrogance to think I even know what this really is what this really is about. Because once I get into production, <coughs> everything shifts. And I, they call me director, but I feel myself more in pursuit of this project, this story. Rather than leaving it, I'm, almost, I'm trying to keep up with it because it's taking on its own life. Such that when I get to the cutting room, uh, at which point it's clear my script is no longer genius. <laughs> and so much is on the cutting room floor. And I begin to distill what is that story. And so even to the point when the movie is finished and people ask me about the movie, I am still connecting dots. So it's a process of, I think, of discovery and self-discovery at that. I don't know how better to ask. So we have to finish there on that note. Uh, this is just the first session. There's a second following. I want to thank Todd. Uh, for his
and he is also teaching an online course through the MOOC system. Is it a system? Okay, edX. Um, it's on the history of Hollywood, and that's actually um, open to the public. Um, if you like more information about the program, please see it here after the program. And what we thought we'd start with um, are a few trailers. Um, this way that the people who are in here are not familiar with the work of Todd Solon to have some visual context. So we were going to start with Welcome to the Dollhouse, which was his first, um, I would say, hit movie. Um, and next we're going to show Dark Horse, um, since we spent a lot of time talking about that. And we wanted to also show you the latest film, Wiener Dog, which came out earlier this year. And Todd was actually at the Ritz talking about the film, and it was amazing. So how many of you were at that screening? So you know how fantastic the film is, but the rest of you are not going to see it. successful at Cannes, 
it was successful in the, it was successful in the league and You know, when they say theatrical, look, it's in fine in, your, in this country, mm. it, it, it made barely three million. Okay, it got talked about so much, you would think it would really have made money, but I mean, let's say it had a legitimate distributor. It maybe that it would have made ten percent, twenty percent more. We're still talking three point three six. was nothing. So the movie never was. I, I never imagined uh, it, it to become. In fact, I still haven't. Me and the producers, we still haven't been paid fully for that movie. That's you know, in Hollywood, the one thing you can say they are always creative about is accounting. Um, the, the most remarkable creativity. When people say Hollywood's not creative, I say no, that is not true. So you've worked with Hollywood subsidiaries um, yeah. and independent companies like Good Machine. Yes. What's your relationship to Hollywood? Are, are you a Hollywood filmmaker? I don't think they would look at me as one. I, it's not. I, I just, I'm, I write my own material, I'm not, I have, I can go to movies that are, are made by the studios, but by and large the movies that interest me are not, I, and, and so um, I'm just not interested and it doesn't make sense. If, you know, years ago I, I had uh, a long dinner with Drew Barrymore, we were talking about Charlie's Angels. And, and I had an idea about how I could play with that. Um, and she was game, she loved the idea, but we both knew, I mean, if I were the head of a studio, I wouldn't hire me either. <laughs> Their movie made 300 million, mine made me 300,000. Nobody would have gone on. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't make sense. The question is, you know, it's really about survival as a non-studio filmmaker. Um, but as you know, today, most of the energy and focus is now on television in any case. Uh, movie going is such an anachronistic sort of, well, it's almost like opera. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's not uh, the way it once was, the touchstone around which so much of the cultural discourse revolved, okay? It no longer holds that centrality uh, that, that, that it once did, and one has to accept that I'm okay, I love opera, okay? So I'm fine with that. So it's so on Amazon and Netflix now, um, the opera producers there, even though they have kind of streamers <laughs> on demand, they actually will give filmmakers theatrical runs in ways that other companies don't. Yes, uh, you know, it's being worked out. They're still figuring it out. Um, I had a theatrical run. It would have been a different run, um, I think, if it had been uh, worked out with a theatrical distributor directly. Um, but uh, that's the way things operate now, and um, uh, things are always shifting, always. You know, right now, Amazon is receptive to a filmmaker like me, but one year, two years' time, it could be a whole different crew there, and then Amazon is out of the picture, but then someone comes along, just like, a, like Megan Ellison and Annapurna came along uh, and embraced certain filmmakers that the studios wouldn't. So, you have, you're constantly looking for that next uh, a stone that you can jump to as you cross the, the, that brook uh, and, and, and hope you don't fall <laughs> <slash. laughs> yeah. yeah. My metaphor is not very good. So how do actors, though, like to work with you? You've worked with a lot of people who are opted in through the million number. Um, I don't know, what, what does Hollywood actor mean? I mean, an actor is an actor. An actor goes where the work is, and, and ideally where work is, is rewarding um, uh, in and of itself. But, and, and, and the life of an actor is, is complicated today because of, everything has changed because of the internet, okay? Everything, the whole business, the whole experience, of, of, of movie going, it's, everything has changed since the advent of the internet, yeah. for better and for worse. How did it change? 
Well, as you know, I mean, you go and you go home, you've got like 2,000 options on TV, okay? <laughs> and you can spend like, or you watching TV can just be surfing for 30 minutes, okay, to land on something, okay? And you have to think, why should I pay ten, fifteen dollars to go to the movie theater when I've got so much at home? This is the big challenge. Now I do think that movie theaters will are not going anywhere soon. I mean I think they will not be extinct anytime soon because young people when they're 15, 16 years old and they want to go out on a date. That's the cheapest, best place to go. It's a dark room, and you can have a nice time like that. So you need that space, okay? Um, but um, it's 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 touch and go. It's it's really it's really everyone. No one knows any more than anyone knows where are things gone with Trump. Who knows? You know. So, um, uh, but so you talk about. Doing TV projects or a serial projects? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, yes, um, it's, it's possible, um, but all of the elements, it has to be, it has to make sense for everybody. And as I say, since I am primarily motivated by material I generate, um, uh, that's my, that's always my um, uh, priority. Um, I, I, I mean, I could make life so much easier if I just did things that don't interest me, or things that interest me less. Um, but I'm overtaken by stuff that I generate myself, and so that's where my head is. And it limits the possibilities because my kind of approach is not something that is uh, appealing to a lot of these profit hungry uh, so, networks. So let's talk about um, if I could work. Um, how, where, where do your ideas come from? Is it just one project merged into the next? After you finish the project, is there a period where you don't quite know what you're doing next, or you're already on to something else? I never know what I'm doing next. Um, I I hope I have a movie that I wrote that um, I plan to shoot soon, I hope. Um, I have cast the leads, um, and it's set in Texas. Um, it's different from, I think, in, in very notable ways from everything I've done before, insofar as it actually has a plot. <laughs> um, it's very uh, much a movie, 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 and um, I I don't know though. Will it happen? I, it it could happen gradually and never, or suddenly. I don't know. Okay. Um, so I can't sit around waiting, and so I write other things because I find the problem is if I don't write, if I don't get absorbed in projects, I'm susceptible to succumbing to terrible depression. And I and and every time I think, no, it's too painful making movies is a nightmare, it's horrible, I'm off, I'm done. I could go weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then I start succumbing and I've got to get onto something or I really get very depressed. So it's almost like I make movies not because I want to make them, but because I have to avoid to save myself from depression. Yeah. So tell us about the, the Texas movie. Have you already thought about music and casting? You well, I have the stars cast. I have two stars. Oh, yeah. oh already yeah. 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 So I just, it's just figuring out how viable it is. So if, 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 we'll see. Okay. Then I, I, I actually wrote a play last summer. I did write a play. I hadn't written one in like since college. When I was in college, I wrote a lot of plays, all mercifully unproduced, <laughs> just remarkably embarrassing plays. And, and so it took me a long time to sort of revisit the idea of writing the theater. But I wrote something, and I think we're going to figure out how to put something on. So, so I'm going to do that. And then 
And then other thing, you know, I just see what whatever feels whatever feels that takes me, that whatever pulls at me, that I feel I have to invest myself in. That's what determines. I uh, and that's why I, the one thing that's stable in my life is teaching. And teaching, I love also because it's like no stress. As I said, I love looking at all the young people and they go, they're all panic stricken. My life is going to be determined with this short film and they're all red. <laughs> and, you know, I can be very sympathetic, empathetic. And I go home and I have a nice family dinner, you know, but they have to really, they have stress. So for me, it's, it's just a pleasure. I really love the process of teaching. Um, and I never, you know, when I was young, uh, when I first finished school, uh, 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 going to film school, I thought uh, the last thing I would ever do was teach. I thought, loserville. I mean, there's no way I would ever be a teacher. But you get older, you get a little bit wiser, and life changes. And so, uh, if my teaching helps you with your own process, it does. It does it, to the extent that it's very easy to go and say, "Oh, that movie was a piece of shit," or "That movie was so stupid." But though, but when you're a teacher, you have to articulate, and you have to you have to articulate the problems and identify, and you have to. In my head, I, my job, because a student once said asked me to solve her problem, and I said, no, that's not my job. Your job is for you to solve your problem, and I try to help you solve your problem. And that's what they have to, but I, in my head, I am thinking of solve, I solve the problem, but I can't tell her, because then it's my movie. She's got to figure it out. I, ha I don't want to, I fail as a teacher when I give out good ideas, you know. I have to get them to come up with, to find their own. Yeah. So how do you do it yourself? A deal you bounce ideas off of? No. No. And you just sit in a room. That's it. It's discipline. <laughs> There's no magic. You actually get a pencil or a computer, however you do it. And if the computer is tricky because there's the constant temptation, oh, email, oh, this website, check that, and then you're not writing. And that's a discipline, it's all a discipline, writing. And you have to submerge yourself there and do that on a regular basis. If you don't, then all you are is a quote writer, a quote filmmaker. Um, one of the things going to film school for a lot of the young people, they say, I want to be a director. I mean, that's why I came to film school. And then they discover on the first day, wait, if I want to be a director, that means I need a story. And if I need a story, that means I have to write a story. And they discover that's the first great and ultimate challenge for all directors is not only, you don't have to be a, a writer per se, but you have to know how to tell a story. Um, Scorsese, Hitchcock, they're not writers, but they have a sense of story. And they know how to work with writers. And they, uh, they can read a script and they can identify and understand story. That is what is fundamental. And that is always a great challenge day one of school and the very last day three years later when they still have the same struggles. There's a great um, Trifoco. He was asked, does he prefer writing, directing, or editing? They said, when I'm directing, I like writing, when I'm editing, I like uh, directing. Uh, do you feel like you could direct someone else's material? Or no? Well, it's not a question of could I. Yes, I could. But so can a lot of other people. I mean, I, there are a lot of TV shows that this is, you know, Mad Men is great, you know, or whatever your great show is. They're great, but then well, they don't need me. It's already been done. They've already figured it. They just need someone a cog in the machine. I don't want to be a cog, okay? <laughs> I, yeah, I've got one life. I want to spend it doing my stuff, okay? And figuring my stuff out. I may not get very far, that's okay. Um, but that's why I have the stability of an actual job. Um, which is, which, which, uh, 
which is pleasurable and fun. Because filmmaking is anything but fun. You know, it's funny, Agnelli, he'll tell you, like, he never feels more alive than when he's directing with a hundred crap cast and crew around him, surrounding him. Me, it's like I just see me on my obituary, Mr. So Long Collapse the Third Day. <laughs> and so all it is is stress. It's stress. And is there enough? Are, are you, the actor, every issue and everything, there's always a problem. And really, they say direct is really problem solver, you know. And always, you, as a director, you want to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. That's what you need. All the smart directors know this. So, are you happy with your films when I finish? <coughs> when you look at them, you think I would do differently. Well, of course. I mean, I'm always, you know, when I was younger, it was much harder. I was harder on myself, and I and I tend to always look at my work and only see the flaws. And now I'm at a point in my life I can see, oh, okay, I appreciate what I was able to achieve. You never, it's always, there's always a level of compromise. And you always, it's different compromise from the compromise you would make if you were working with a studio. But compromise nevertheless, and also failure uh, to some extent. Why didn't I think of this? Why didn't I do that? Why I should have? You only get one shot, you know. Um, but I don't. I'm, I'm very gratified by, by what I have been able to achieve, and I hope I get to continue. So filmmaking brings in so many different kinds of creativity and and, and, art and different skills. You're working with people. You're working with the camera. Uh, I know you're actually really interested in the music in your films. Are you, are you a musician too? I no, look at my mother. If she thinks, if had I but continued, I'd have been the next Bob in Horowitz. But she's delusional. <laughs> I, I, I had, I loved, um, I love music, but I, 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 I have everything but talent. Um, but I, I do love working with musicians. I do, um, and I love that that process. And I've gotten to know a lot of musicians, and and they've been very. Perceptive, and it's it's you know it's like I I the Ventura Van Hart I I, uh, I wanted to use a song of his and, um, and then I find out he loves my movies and he, and I get and he and he he records a song for me and, and he says it's all right if if, if Beck helps me on this I say okay <laughs> I mean it's just you know Bell and Sebastian you know the whole nine crew of them came to Jersey City for me. Know, or Hoboken, I mean, but you know, it's like I feel, whoa, I'm so lucky. You know, I, I'm always grateful for what, what success, the great thing about success is that it opens doors, that you get to engage and work with people who you might otherwise not be able to. Um, and so that's really what's great um, about success. Um, people always say you learn from failure. I learn a lot more from success. <laughs> okay, last question for a little bit. But uh, tell me about your, your style and your actors. I don't know if I have a style. Every actor is different, you know, and has different needs. Um, I, you have to identify those needs, and uh, I, I oftentimes I, I, I audition. Uh, what I do is I audition people, and uh, that audition is the rehearsal. And where I uh, assess, you know, their strengths, the weaknesses, the, the range, the limitations. And if I need more rehearsal, I have a callback. Because as soon as you offer the part, rehearsal costs money, and we never have it in our budget for rehearsal. So that's what the audition is. Um, and um, some uh, actors, are fun and a pleasure, and some less so. <laughs> but um, uh, 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 look, I, I, yes, I, I mean, on um, uh, look, on Dollhouse, uh, the, the, the Heather Myers was very gifted. It's very easy. She was very naturally gifted, and um, and so was my comments were much more in the vein of the classic, more or less, you know. 
But with her little sister, she was actually a Ukrainian immigrant. She'd only been in the country for six months, and I was worried about her accent. And also, she's not really an actress. I mean, she was eight, but she wasn't gifted in the way other kids. You can see, it's funny. Already, you can see certain... It's a gift, and it's very hard. It's an ineffable quality that, that actors have. She didn't have it. But what she did have was the ability to mimic. So what I did at the audition was I would deliver lines, and I wanted to see if she could repeat them exactly as I had delivered. And she could mimic beautifully. So I could get, through very artificial methods, a very naturalistic performance. And because the camera would be going, I would give the line just as I wanted it, and she would repeat out, out right out to me, and, and like that, cutting things out and so forth. I was able to craft something that comes across very natural, but of course it is entirely artificial. Um, but and also, look, some actors want attention, hold my hand, some actors, don't talk to me, okay, peace, you know? You just <laughs> go with whatever you need, whatever, whatever the actor needs in order to get the performance you want up here, you know. That's right, you're putting the, the two cardinal roles, first children and then animals. I heard, I heard the dog and the inner dog was not cooperative. Well, you know, I, I don't know why they compare children and dogs. <laughs> I, I never, I've always had delightful experiences. I have to say, with all my children, they've always been pleasurable across the board. Um, and in part because I think I, I, you treat them respectfully and they just give you the world. They listen. And one thing about children, they listen. You, they, they don't improvise. <laughs> they listen. They know their lines. They know them exactly as you've written them. And if, if, if I tell the, the kid just to walk from here to there, they do it. With an adult, it's like, why? Or they don't know their lines. And they think they can just wing it or improvise it. But that's why, you know, kids have never had trouble. Whereas with adults, you know, I had one situation, I had an actress in one movie, and she had a big speech. And, and she, after a couple of lines, she would keep stumbling. She would just stumble every time. And I, and I, and I, said, she said, I don't know what the, why am I in trouble? I said, maybe you didn't memorize it. <laughs> and I actually, I had to put, what do you call those cards? Um, cue cards. Cue cards. <laughs> and, so that she could get through the whole speech, and then with the magic of cutting, I was like, she's so good, where do you find her? <laughs> All she's doing is reading the fucking cue card. <laughs> and it's, if, if there's one thing that an actor is required to do is to memorize the lines. I mean, that is the job description, know your lines, you know. But, but um, so that, sometimes that, I, I, have, I, I do remember once with, uh, Back on the dollhouse, I remember I wanted that actor to say fascist. Um, uh, and he didn't want to say it. I don't think he knew what a fascist was. <laughs> so, okay. but, but I, all I needed was one take. I got it and all of his stuff I could throw out. But I, you know, I, look, I'm happy. If an actor gives me something that I have a dream that I think is better, believe me, I take credit for it, okay? okay. But um, most of the time, really, they don't come up with better. It just is not quite as good as what was there initially. Um, I sometimes improvise. Sometimes there is improvisation, though. In Dark Horse, I know Chris Walken, he likes to improvise, and there was space. And uh, you build any improvisation, or you just use? Uh, no, no, I, I, you know, it's, everything has to be within parameters, within very clearly defined parameters. <laughs> Otherwise, it just gets mushy and it just becomes garbage. But if you define clearly what the scene, what the purpose of what the scene is, then an actor can go off in places, and, and the lead was also with Mia Farrow, she doesn't like, she's not much of in some of it, they don't really do much improvisation, but Chris uh, liked to do it, and um, 
and my my lead in that did as well. So you 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 uh, you work with what you have, and, and you discover things. You try to recognize early on that might be things to uh, be alert to to avoid if there are mannerisms and things like that. Um, but um, I I love I do love working with actors. I do. Um, but most of the job is not working with actors. Most of the job is like your AD is saying, you can only get one more take because we're losing this location in about 18 minutes. <laughs> and, the, and, and you have to just like smile and act like everything's fine as the world is crumbling. You know, it's like, it, that's, it's, it's constantly putting forth like, oh yes, I'm confident everything is great. So everyone, and you certainly don't want to make the actors feel insecure in any way, especially when things are falling apart. You really have to not let anyone know, okay? Um, and uh, so that's that's why it's it's just a nightmare every time. But that's the price. I, it's not that I wanted to be a director, but that's the price I pay in order to make the movies. So we have like ten minutes for for questions if you want more. Not this one. He wanted to ask me something. Else. Uh, well, I was curious at uh, a film like Happiness how you're able to. What is your process of pitching such sensitive material to the child actors, their parents, to the locations that you're going to say, "I'm shooting a film that's about this." I don't know. Well, first of all, I don't pitch. Okay, never pitch anything. I I know people talk about pitching that I just have never pitched. I wrote a script. Here's a script. Okay. I give, if you're going to work with a child in a movie, even if the movie doesn't have troubling, disturbing, what have you, I think it's incumbent upon you to share and be open. This is what it is. You show the parents. The parents then decide, is this for my child? Is this not for my child? Okay? You just, as long as you're open and straightforward, no problem. Okay? That's how it is with kids. I know a lot of kids, you know, a lot of kids dropped out once when their parents saw the script. I said, fine. Important time to drop out is now during the audition period, not when we're on set. And the way you avoid that is you just have to be upfront about what is involved here. Um, as far as locations, that's on, um, that's TBD, you know, um, that's really... <laughs> Uh, very often that's something, unless there's something that's, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, the location, to be frank, the location manager handles that, I don't, uh, in terms of permission and, and, but we have sometimes there are discussions, do we need to share or do we not need to share? Those are, so it's a case by case thing. Um, did I cover you? The yeah, edges. I don't know. Like, yeah, there was that producers. Is anyone that would that you need to get? You know, the the main cast and crew that are that are fundamental in making the film. The people that you need to fundamental, uh, but not fundamental is fundamental is correct. <laughs> um, but I, I, um, you have to be open. I find if you try to be cagey and coy, if you try to hide. If you try in any way to deceive, you deserve what you get. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, you have to be open. Um, in your newest film, We Know Dog, uh, Daniel Vigo plays a film school professor. Yeah. And a lot of your movies, you have characters that are probably more closely similar to you than anybody else. In We Know Dog, Daniel Vigo seems to be unhappy as a professor. And, uh, I just wanted to ask you or some of you who teaches graduate students at NYU, do you find students that are obsessed with like, superhero movies or trying to figure out that what if? Whereas Remember, we're talking about fiction here. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> I, 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 I have the freedom to reshape reality any which way I like. I have certain life experience, but um, to me, for me, I was compelled by the idea of a story of redemption, of a quest for meaning. Um, uh, that uh, this that, that this character has his his quest for meaning in a, a life that's been demeaned. 
Um, and, uh, but I don't think any of my students would confuse me with this character, in the, uh, except in the most superficial ways, uh, i.e. we're both old. Um, and I like being old. That's the thing. Um, I, 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 everyone says, like, oh, you're getting old and older. I love it. Oh, my God. I thank God I'm not young. Thank God. Um, so I, I, um, but I don't, um, I, I, it, it's not a portrait of NYU. That, that would be a different movie. A much more movie where I would show off probably just the corruption and incompetence that is a part of the management. The young actress who had only been in the country for a short amount of time. What was her selling point? Why were you willing to work with her? Wait, which actress? In the doll house. The younger sister. The younger sister. The younger sister. What, why did I like her? Yes. Well, she had this quality of she was very she was she wanted to be a model. She wanted to be a supermodel. I think she came from a family, a dynasty of ballet dancers, and the whole generation, that whole dynasty, would was going to crash with this one child would break into supermodel stardom. But but she she had the quality I was looking for, and so I if if she could pass my mimicking test, I was going to gamble on that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the phrase earlier, striking tender cones, the content of your beauty can do that. Um, I I find your beauties can be quite disturbing, but they're also touching, and you know they they kind of walk that line. Um, also, of my heart really like them, but I'm like afraid of them. You know, uh, you, there seems to be a theme of writing challenging, provocative material. Uh, does that, does any you know particular artist or work inspire you to do that, or are there any contemporary films that you sort of feel like scared that you were scared of? You still I don't know. I I I mean, there are, I can list movies I've seen that I like and so forth, but. I, I, um, uh, when I go to the movies, I do want to be moved. Um, I want to be surprised, in some sense, that my expectations are upended in some way. Um, I like to be surprised that I can be moved. Um, and provoked in this way that makes me, in some sense, and maybe this is something of a, uh, a source of my work and work I respond to, it's always that sense that you are not alone in this world. And that, oh my god, you watch a movie and it's like, he sees or she sees something that I know that I didn't know that sometimes movies have the magical power to articulate experience that we may not even be able to communicate with our intimates. That there are things that can be expressed that make one that can make one feel that again that we are that we are connected in some way to <coughs> the world. Very good thing. We have time for one last question. <laughs> um, kind of piggybacking off of what you just said, and I know this is a good question right now, but how are you responding to the results of the presidential election? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, look, I, it's, 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 you know, um, no one knows. We don't know where any of this is going. Is we don't we, we we saw Brexit. We see this next. I don't know Marine Le Pen. I there. You know it's it's a phenomenon that we're all grappling with, um, and um, we have no choice but to confront as best we can.